Okay, Ian, welcome, and I am going to make you co-host. There you go. So thank you so much, Ian, Ian Hamp, Tricia Sauer, both people who uh, do a ton of work for civic engagement beyond voting um, and are helping us with the with the chat today. So um, let me go ahead and introduce our, our guests today. So we are going to be talking about the water in Arizona, and we are so incredibly fortunate to have two of the state's leading experts on water here um, to give us the, you know, how what we are going through now, what we have to look forward to in the future, and what are some of the solutions that we might be able to propose. So first of all, we have Sarah Porter. She is director of the Kyle Center for Water Policy at Arizona State University's Morrison Institute of Public Policy. And she is professor of practice in ASU's College of Global Futures. Sarah came to the Kyle Center from the National Audubon Society, where she served as the Arizona State Director and led Audubon's Western Rivers Project, a multi-state initiative to protect and restore important river habitats in the Intermountain West. Sarah serves on Governor Hobbs Water Policy Council, the University of Arizona's Water Resources Research Center's External Advisory Council, Phoenix's Environmental Quality and Sustainability Commission, and in 2023, Sarah was named to the Arizona Capital Times list as an unsung hero in recognition of her work on Arizona water policy. Ah, now, Sandy Barr is the director for the Grand Canyon, Arizona chapter of the Sierra Club, where her responsibilities include advocating for environmental protection, equity and democracy, including climate action and justice. Sandy monitors and advocates on environmental protection, clean energy and climate justice at the Arizona State Legislature, the Arizona Corporation Commission, and a whole bunch of other state and federal agencies. So um, welcome both of you and I will spotlight both of you and we will get started. So welcome, welcome. Um, the first thing we would like to do is to just make sure we get straight the facts of Arizona's current water situation and proposed solutions. But the very first thing I want to do is level set with information about where our water comes from, where it goes, and Sarah, this is over to you. Since we were both history majors, please feel free to throw in any historical details. Well, thank you. I appreciate. Uh, I, I, in a, in our email exchange, um, Kathy and I both connected that we were undergraduate history majors, and I said that's why I love water so much because to understand what's going uh, on with water in Arizona is to learn a lot of Western history. Um, so let me just start with the basics, uh, and I'm going to share, I won't share all night long, but sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And so and I have a few things to help us uh, level set, as, as Kathy mentioned. Um, so there we go. So um, let's talk about water supply and demand statewide. Before I do that, I'd just like to mention that my organization, the Kyle Center for Water Policy, uh, at, is part of Arizona State University's Morrison Institute for Public Policy, um, it is, which is a 40-something-year-old think tank de dedicated to uh, looking, you know, doing critical analysis, neutral, nonpartisan policy analysis on issues of importance to Arizona. The Kyle Center is about 10 years old. And we just focus on water, but neutral, nonpartisan. We have we are we are not an advocacy organization. So, in the big picture, Arizona has four sources of water, as you can see here on this beautiful pie chart. Um, and to break it down, we have water from the Colorado River, 
And the Colorado River supplies are shared with six other states and Mexico, 29 sovereign tribes. Uh, it's a place of extraordinary habitat. Uh, and the river is also uh, critical to economies throughout the American Southwest. Um, we have other river water from our in-state rivers and the biggest in-state river system uh, that people in Arizona benefit from is the Salt Birdie system, which is managed by SRP. We have reclaimed water, that's water that has entered the wastewater treatment system and then is treated uh, fit for a reuse. And finally, groundwater. Um, I have come to realize that we talk about groundwater a lot, but we don't always explain or, or share an understanding of what we're really talking about. Um, what we're talking about is the moisture that is uh, in, the, in the particles underground. Um, some people have the impression that there are underground rivers or underground lakes. That really isn't what we're talking about here. We're talking about moisture that is percolated down into the materials under our feet that we can pump out. And no surprise, it doesn't rain a lot in most parts of Arizona. And we are very good at pumping out groundwater much faster than nature replenishes it. In fact, most of the aquifers in Arizona took up 20 to 25,000 years to fill. And we are really capable of dewatering aquifers very quickly within a matter of decades. And so that's a big management challenge for the state of Arizona. More on that, I'm sure. Uh, this is um, uh, where our water demand comes from, or in other words, who's using the water. About 72% of the water that's used in Arizona, used by humans, is going for crop irrigation. Uh, the big red pie slice uh, for, for domestic is referring to water that people use in their homes. So about 16% of the water that is used in Arizona by humans is used in their households. Um, and then you can see the rest of the breakdown. Commercial would be water that is primarily delivered by cities to taps for businesses. Golf is a sizable 3% of water demand in the state and about equal, I think it's quite interesting to the amount of water that's used to generate electricity. And then mining another, I should say 1% and then some other stuff. And I will just very briefly um, break down the water supplies for the Phoenix and Tucson area. Uh, you can see in the in the the Phoenix area has the benefit of that salt verde system, uh, and so it, it's a big part of the Phoenix area's water supply. And then, um, and well, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, Tucson doesn't have the benefit of a big in-state river system like the salt verde system and therefore is more dependent on Colorado River water. Um, now, much more, I'm sure that through the course of the, of the discussion, we'll have much more to say about um, the, the supplies of water, but I will uh, try to keep it short, but leave you with the um, fact that the primary responsibility for securing water supplies for a community typically happens at a very local level. So the vast majority of people in Arizona get their water from a water provider, a community water system. It might be a city or a private company or a, a small a domestic water improvement district. And it's that entity that is responsible for making sure of sufficient water and delivering it, typically. Of course, there are many variations. There isn't, um, the state of Arizona is not responsible for making sure that everybody has water, no matter where they live, um, or that everybody has all the water they need to do the thing they want with. Uh, we tend to have um, the, that, that responsibility fall at a very local level. That is all really, really interesting. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Sarah. And um, I think that it's pretty obvious that we wouldn't even be having this conversation if we had plenty of water to serve, you know, to serve our needs for the next, you know, 100 years. So, Sandy, um, how long has it been since state leaders realized that uh, we were going to run into problems and you know what are some of the things that have already been done to address the our water supply 
issues. Yeah, well, again, thanks so much for having me be here today. And hi, everyone. Um, I would start with that I'm not sure that we have ever really recognized that there are limits uh, to uh, our water supplies. Whenever there's an issue with water, there is a proposal to go find it someplace else. Uh, you may remember just a couple years ago, there was the, the bill passed for water augmentation and to look at going to the Gulf of California to desalinate water and pipe it up to Arizona. And they seriously actually passed a resolution to pipe water from the Mississippi. And I feel like it's always been the way, okay, we have some limits here. Let's go see where we can swipe some more water and just keep growing the same way we are and growing the same things that we are relative to agriculture. Uh, so I, I don't think we've actually acknowledged it. That being said, there have been some things that have been done. Uh, early on, the focus was on protecting consumers. Uh, you probably have all heard stories about land speculators in Arizona. They're still here. Um, they're also water speculators. But the land speculation back in the 60s and 70s uh, resulted in people buying uh, land that had no water attached to it. And so part of uh the movement was to try and get some consumer protections for people. And that came about as part of the Groundwater Management Act, which was also instigated by Arizona wanting to get the Central Arizona project through. So there were a lot of different things going on. Uh, also, we were seeing things like land subsidence and earth fissures in a lot of places with groundwater pumping. Again, something else that is hurting uh, both the environment and consumers. And so the Groundwater Management Act was passed in 1980 and it established active management areas in certain parts of the state, mostly more urban areas. And uh, there, it also provided mechanisms for establishing additional active management areas and also irrigation non-expansion areas. Now, I'll just briefly say there are roughly three groundwater uh, constructs in Arizona. Mm -hmm. There is the construct outside the active management areas and outside the irrigation non-expansion areas that is basically anything goes. You know, you, you just, your pumping is supposed to be reasonable and reasonable mm -hmm. seems to mean just about anything. Irrigation non-expansion areas that um, they just limit adding additional acres of agriculture, but they don't actually limit how much is pumped on the existing acres of agriculture. And then active management areas include a number of things, including uh, uh, not adding new agriculture and uh, also that if there's a subdivision, it has to have a hundred year assured water supply. And there's some other things. They establish management goals for those active management areas. Uh, here in Phoenix, we're in an active management area. There's one in Tucson and Prescott. Can um, I share the map, um, Sandy? Oh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. So to, just to um, clarify where the, what, <clears throat> where the active management areas are. Yeah, there's... <clears throat> And I think one of the things that we're grappling with now is that 
Active management areas really are designed for places that, are, that anticipate urban growth. And there, it's not, it, it's probably too much regulation for a place that has a groundwater problem because of a new demand from agriculture or just from one lone industry, but especially agriculture, which tends to be the, the culprit or the cause of new demand that causes uh, water tables to decline. And so we have been in this protracted conversation in the state about how to create a framework for, um, for groundwater management in places that are, you know, that the communities that might want some form of groundwater management, but nothing quite so onerous as the AMAs. I would argue that it's it's not so much not so onerous because I don't feel like uh, AMAs are onerous. Uh, it's just a different type of regulation that's needed, um, but not you know. It it the focus doesn't need to be so much on development. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to add in establishing these um, limits on groundwater pumping, there was no recognition really of environmental protection, including protection of surface water, much of which is connected to uh, groundwater. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we have seen, uh, and I, I can talk more about rivers later, but um, we've seen a lot of surface water dried up because of groundwater pumping, because it doesn't actually uh, protect it. And then finally, I just wanted to say <clears throat> the Groundwater Management Act passed in 1980. Uh, no one, I think, thought that it was going to be the be all end all. In fact, even the people who were part of drafting it did not think that. Uh, but rather than strengthen it over the years, improve it, uh, expand it. Uh, the Arizona legislature has carved out loopholes, weakened it, uh, set up ways, um, workarounds for assured water supply. Uh, and this session was no different. And so I think one of the big problems we've had is that Groundwater Management Act was passed and people were like, okay, well, we're done. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's just, you know, take a little out here and a little there. And, uh, and then we haven't done anything to improve it. And we've, we've known about issues with people's wells drying up, with land subsidence, with earth fissures in these communities for a long time. And while the whole legislature scrambled to make sure Rio Verde got its water, they didn't do anything for the rest of the state. And that just shows you how if you have loud legislators who have uh, power, then you, you can um, get your community taken care of. But by and large, the rest of them have not. Or if you're, if you're having a water problem and you're adjacent to a major metropolitan area and the national and international media think that your water problem is the is the tip of the iceberg that it's the the, the first domino falling? Yeah. I think there was a lot of urgency around Rio Verde because that was the first year of Colorado River shortage. Um, people, pe water, many water experts. I think this this is changing, but <clears throat> there has been a reluctance to uh, talk about water challenges. I would say in Arizona, um, it's sort of like we'll we'll take care of it. Don't don't bother um, yeah. people. Yeah, <laughs> repeatedly problem. they yes. have said, yeah. "Oh, we don't want to see Arizona on the front page of the New York Times." I don't yeah. know why they always worry about the New York <laughs> Times, but they always say <laughs> that. And then, of course, what happened? We bet on uh, oh. the front page of the so, New York Times because they failed to act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it sounds to me um, like we basically have a patchwork of water um, 
water regulation, you know, with the AMAs, Sandy, as you said, where, you know, if you're outside of an AMA, it's basically anything goes. And then the Colorado River, I know that compact is being renegotiated. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, one of the issues we've sort of been dancing around is, is climate change. And uh, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor, most of Arizona is in severe to exceptional drought, uh, the most extreme rating. So who who wants to go first in sort of talking about the impact of climate change on our water supply? Well, I would like Sandy to talk about water change, but I want to specifically address that idea. Um, I checked the drought monitor and and I didn't for now, I didn't see that it was in, um, let me see if I can share. I don't know what I've done to my screen here. Um, but anyway, can you see the, this is yeah. the most recent yeah. drought monitor um, okay. map. And it doesn't show us in you know extreme and exceptional drought. Um, so the drought is kind of a moving target. And, okay. and the reason why this matters is that much of the water that people in Arizona uses is not dependent on seasonal rainfall. Um, it's dependent because of the way Arizona developed. There are reservoirs that hold water in wet years all along um, the Salt Verde system, for example, and Lake Mead and Lake Powell and other reservoirs on the Colorado River. And so we, especially for Phoenix and Tucson, the water that people use is largely imported water, imported from the watersheds in the north and east part of Arizona. That's the water that uh, that is the flows for the Salt and Verde rivers, and also the waters from the Upper Rockies. That are the water; uh, those are the water sources for uh, the Colorado River. Like eighty percent of the water in the Colorado. So when we think about when we think about climate change, we need to be thinking about um, those water supplies, but annual drought isn't as relevant as what's happening over the long term. Right. Um, according to the U.S. Yeah. Geological Survey, for every 1% Celsius increase in temperature in the upper Rockies, we can expect about a 9% decrease in flows in the Colorado River. So that's kind of, that's what we have. And then I'll hand it over um, to Sandy, but I always like, I think it's important for us not to think about seasonal drought in Arizona as what our water issues are about. They, it, that matters, but that isn't, um, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't tell us much of the story. Great, thank you. <laughs> well, Sandy. and I, I would just argue the long-term trends. Yes, mm -hmm. we need to, and long-term we, I, yeah. I don't like to call it a uh, drought because I feel like we um, have moved into a new uh, normal, if you will, relative to um, our, you know, our climate. And so that is, uh, I feel like, you know, maybe a little bit misleading too. Mm -hmm. But overall, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, on the Colorado River, first of all, it was always over allocated. So there never was enough water in the Colorado River to serve all of the um, allocations for the various um, states and, uh, and of course, Mexico as well. And so um, we start out with a Colorado River system that's over allocated. And then, yes, climate change. You know, we all of the uh, research that we have seen indicates that the trend is for less water in the Colorado River. And there are um, uh, additional impacts uh, from having uh, less water. It's not just that we have to take shortages, but there are impacts like when Lake Powell drops so low that those intakes uh, no longer uh, um, function properly. Are we going to have adequate water uh, through the Grand Canyon? We also see impacts to native fishes from how that whole system is being operated. And even though uh, we're 
you know, we don't have drought this year, we still have Lake Powell that is, you know, much lower than, than normal. And Lake Mead, of course, is the one that determines uh, whether or not we take uh, shortages on our Colorado River water. But uh, climate change is affecting all of our rivers. Um, it, you know, we in Arizona are one of the fastest warming states in the country and um, warmer air uh, holds more moisture. So you can get a lot of your water at the same time versus spread out more. And so it's not just how we're getting or how much water we're getting, but how, how we're getting it and how intense it is. So, so that's another issue with, with climate change as well. Uh, more sedimentation because of getting a lot more water all at once versus um, uh, over time. And of course, uh, we have denuded a lot of our riparian areas, which I was going to talk more about later. Uh, and overall, uh, the uh, climate change has significantly affected the flows in our rivers and streams. We also see more wildfire, and that affects uh, flows in our rivers and streams, including sedimentation. Uh, it's changing the range of species and uh, obviously threatening a number of our forest systems. So mm -hmm. yes, that's, I, I guess I'll just stop there. The, there, the, there isn't really clear guidance on how climate change will impact um, water supply of, apart from hotter, drier, we know that snow melts differently. You know, um, we know we know that the systems, especially the Colorado system, don't work in the way they were built to work because of the changes in um, temperature and um, all kinds of different variables. But um, I would say that for flowing rivers, which I know we're going to talk about, that the oh, let me say one more thing about climate change. One prediction is just greater variability. So the West is used to having strings of dry year. That's the, the climate without climate change is strings of dry year, dry years punctuated by extremely wet years, um, you, you know, where it's, a, it's a, a multiple of the precipitation, annual precipitation of the previous years. And um, some climate scientists say that what we can expect is more variability, just this more craziness but we know that the conditions like um, hotter springs, hotter spring times um, mean that the, the whole hydrology, the whole hydrological system works differently than what people assumed. I, yeah. But I was gonna say that talking about rivers, you know, if we're gonna talk about impacts on rivers and flows, the biggest impacts are what humans have done to rivers um, in terms of, um, diverting the water, developing infrastructure to impound the water far beyond uh, any impacts that at least we're seeing now from climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought, Sandy, one thing you said was really interesting, which, and also, Sarah, the the variability, the going from, you know, the results from climate change and the downpours, the fact that warm air holds more moisture. And I remember, it wasn't that long ago, we were having floods up in northern northern Arizona up in the Flagstaff area. So, I mean, we have seen so much evidence of torrential rains and flooding. And I think that that can be very, you know, sort of misperceived as, oh, we don't have a water shortage. Look at all this water. And and in fact, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. And that, that's why we, I think Sandy and I agree that drought is a misleading concept for thinking about water supply for Arizona, at least annual. I mean, long-term trends matter a lot. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah. one rainstorm is even one good year of snow in the upper Rockies won't fix the overallocated Colorado River. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for setting me up for this next question. That was perfect because I've been reading a lot about the negotiations among the uh, Colorado River Basin states over water reallocation. Um, Sarah, could you update us on what's going on there? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the seven states that share Colorado River water have historically done so by consensus. They have a compact called the Colorado Compact, uh, and then a, a lot of agreements that were overlaid in federal legislation and, and Supreme Court decisions that are sort of overlaid on top of the compact. And um, the starting, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, the, the water experts looking at the Colorado River understood that um, the region was going to be in big trouble unless we came up with some agreements to help protect particularly Lake Mead, the reservoir that provides water to California, Arizona, Southern Nevada, and Mexico. And so they came up with an agreement in 2007. They realized almost as soon, before the ink was dry, I would say they knew that it wasn't going to be enough. They came up with another agreement um, and that was called, the, the, the agreement was signed after a lot of um, teeth gnashing and suffering and, and negotiations. It was signed in 2019, it's the Drought Contingency Plan. Uh, and even then, um, the, the negotiators on the Colorado River uh, understood that it wouldn't be sufficient, um, that we, we were still not out of danger. The danger that, that we're dealing with is the danger of the reservoirs uh, getting so low that either hydropower can no longer be produced, and that hydropower is an important source of uh, electricity, particularly for rural communities and tribal communities, or that the reservoirs could go so low that it, they would reach a point called dead pool, where water couldn't be delivered off the reservoirs. Imagine how catastrophic that would be if water didn't flow out of Lake Powell into the Grand Canyon, or if water didn't flow out of Lake Mead um, to, the, to the farms and tribes and cities downstream. So um, knowing the, the DCP expires as of 2026. And so the seven states, uh, as well as Mexico, to some extent, the tribes have been included, something new, um, have been negotiating for, a new, for new management guidelines. So the negotiations aren't to reallocate Colorado River water. They're really over how will shortage be shared? How to share shortage uh, when reservoirs start falling low? Um, and that's what right now we're at a point of very, I would say that regionally we're at a point of very high contention. Um, there are many proposals that uh, have, are being evaluated, uh, but there doesn't seem to be much agreement um, among the negotiators. And I would say it is now broken out between uh, the, the upper basin, which is Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, um, and Utah, and the lower basin. Um, there's a, a disagreement on um, how, to, how to manage the Colorado to stay out of trouble into the future. The, if there is no agreement, I think what will happen is certainly litigation there will definitely be um, claims brought in every which way, and we could have decades of litigation. And it's possible that the federal government, the United States Bureau of Reclamation, um, under the direction of the Secretary of Interior, would take unilateral action. That has been threatened. Um, and, and so that's where we are. And what this really means is uncertainty. It means massive uncertainty for water users throughout the basin, particularly the lower, the lower basin. Very, very difficult for cities. Imagine if you were responsible for making sure that water got to people's taps and you didn't know how much Colorado River water, um, which might be up to a third or half of your portfolio. You just didn't know how much you would have uh, to deliver in 2026. This is, you're a farmer, you need, you need that water to irrigate your crops and you have no idea how do you do a plan um, th th this is the kind of uncertainty that the region is living with. Is there some sort of deadline for when this needs to be yeah. finalized? Te technically, the deadline would be in pretty like December or early. I could think the earliest would be early 2025 because there are, we have to have 
environmental analysis. And that is to right now the Bureau is trying to do the environmental analysis that's required. Um, but also there are always a lot of additional agreements. Sometimes there's a necessity of congressional there, you know, we needed congressional approval for the drought contingency plan. We need binational approval. So essentially an amendment to the, to the international boundary waters treaty between the United States and Mexico. So um, five years ago, the Bureau would have said, we need to have this agreement by 2023, 2024. Now they're, now they're trying to, see if it's possible to push this out. Um, but, but it is not hopeful right now that, they're, that, that they are moving toward a clear agreement. Okay, Sandy, um, I'd like to transition to groundwater and talk about both. And I know you've, you've actually referred to it in several, several different ways in terms of how water, how groundwater is treated in the AMAs, the 1980 Groundwater Management Act. And also, I'd like to see if you could touch on the, the issue of the 100-year assured supply, which is a requirement for residential development in Arizona. So all of that sort of tied in together. Okay. Well, that's not very much. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, le well, let me start with backing up just a step and say, in Arizona, we manage our groundwater and our surface water separately, by and large. There are a few areas where there's some connection, but so we treat them, you know, like they're, they're, isn't a connection when there is, and uh, that has contributed to a lot of problems for our surface waters. But um, one of the things we've ad advocated for is conjunctive management of ground and surface water. Um, so that's the first thing. And then for groundwater, again, in most of our state, there it's anything goes i know we hear a lot about um uh entities from saudi arabia uh, uh pumping a lot of groundwater in rural areas outside of active management areas but the bottom line is they're not the only ones there are uh arizona based entities that are doing that there are huge uh, industrial agricultural operations from Minnesota. Minnesota. Yes. <laughs> How did you know I was good? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so to me, uh, I, I know focusing on the Saudis, you know, gets people to pay attention, but I think it's important that we take it to that next step and go, this is, this is a problem, not just because of this one company or one country. And uh, mm -hmm. we do see uh, these operations uh, drying up people's wells. Uh, people try drilling new wells sometimes if they can afford it, and then that well goes dry. And, and so you have people all over this state who are hauling water because big pumpers came in and uh, and dried up their wells. So uh, anything goes basically. And we have been trying really hard to get a bill moving in the legislature to regulate rural uh, groundwater pumping. Uh, but I will say the chairs of the Natural Resources, Energy and Water Committees have been huge impediments. Gail Griffin, and seen occur, they um, are not interested in doing something real, and I, you know, and they block uh, any positive legislation. And so, it, you know, a lot of times people say, "Well, the legislature isn't doing anything," and we kind of throw them all in the same box. But it's, you know, it really is a few people who are controlling what moves forward, what gets discussed, and in this case, uh, relative to rural water, uh, 
uh, nothing positive has advanced. Uh, and then, of course, we do have the active management areas where there are uh, limits on groundwater pumping. Uh, um, although uh, I mentioned earlier some of the loopholes that were created, and I don't know, I don't know if some people would describe it as a loophole, but I got I, I would. Um, the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District was established uh, by developers, and it is an entity that actually does allow um, developers to pump additional groundwater. They can pump over here uh, while there is a you know, recharge over here. And so it allows for um, impacts in particular areas. And so that whole yeah. I, I could go on and on, but that yeah. whole Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District was set up based on there being excess Colorado River water, and there isn't any. It's really a big old house of cards, and I feel like, you know, that is something that we have to deal with as well. And yeah, that that's a good point. We published a report in 2019 about the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District. In case you're interested, it's no, it's a really good report. It's, I, I refer to it all the time. <laughs> and um, but the every 10 years, the Central Arizona Project has to develop. They run this groundwater replenishment district, and we we cited a, a number of concerns about about the lack of limitations on the growth. How big should we allow this program to go where it's up to the CAP to go find the water and replenish the groundwater that's being pumped for new subdivisions? Uh, and it, um, the new plan of operation, it, this is a very current thing. So um, one way to get engaged is to pay attention. The new plan of operation uh, has been uh, unveiled, essentially. It has to be approved by the board of the CAP. And that's a board, that's a popularly elected board that doesn't hear from um, people as much as you might imagine. Um, so, And uh, there will be five seats on the ballot. Yeah, that's uh, right. Um, five uh, Phoenix area. Is it five Phoenix area yeah. seats? Yeah. And so yeah. there's representation from each of the CAP service area counties, Pima, Pinal, and, and Maricopa. But also then the plan has to be approved by the Director of Water Resources who serves at the pleasure of the governor. And so uh, having, um, you know, a, a, let's say a governor who will have the back of a director of water resources uh, can be, you know, can really make a difference in what happens with the plan of operation for the CAGRD. I do also have to throw in that right now, two of those active management areas are on hold for this program. Um, the Department of Water Resources has modeled the groundwater for the Phoenix AMA and the Pinal AMA and concluded that um, there has to be a moratorium on the kind of development where the developer simply enrolls the subdivision in the groundwater replenishment district and then uses groundwater. So right, we're at this moment where right now, um, the, a developer can't go and get uh, what is called a certificate of assured water supply to do that kind of development. Um, and that's one of the big things that was a, you know, it, there, there's a lot going on. We might, we might get into it. I think Senate Bill 1181 actually allows them to, but um, it's a, there were so many mm -hmm. uh, water bills. This we, we still have a moratorium on certificates of assured water supply in the Phoenix and Pinal AMAs. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's but they're they're providing these this alternative there, there's path. a right the so, department is, so it really is a workaround yeah. well it hasn't the department is in a rule making process to to potentially do to provide a new way it would require the water provider to become a designated assured water supply provider which is it's more rigorous than simply enrolling your land in the GRD. 
we could get we could geek out on this. I don't think we need to, but <laughs> yeah. but it's a rulemaking process. And you know, I think the big question for all of us is would this program strengthen the aquifers or not? And it, you know, and that's that's the important thing here. Yeah, to me, I every time I evaluate a bill or a rule, I am like, is this going to result in less groundwater pumping or or more or mm -hmm. And most of the time, it is not going to reduce the groundwater pumping. Um, the the so. alternative designation that Sandy mentioned, the thing that it does that's potentially risky is allow a water provider like Buckeye. The, the poster children for this are Buckeye and Queen Creek. They, they would like to get out from under the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment Program, and they're having a hard time doing the heavy lift of a uh, acquiring uh, what would be regarded as a renewable non-groundwater, non-local groundwater source of supply to be able to continue to grow. And um, what this alternative proposal would let them do is borrow, borrow from the aquifer and deliver that local groundwater for a certain number of years while they put into motion um, their plans for acquiring a renewable supply like a surface water supply or reclaimed water. And then once they have that new supply, they have to start paying back the aquifer. That's the that's the concept that's being discussed now. Yeah. Trust us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and and trust that there's a governor and a Department of Water Resources director 25 years from now who would be able to shut it off you know it's very hard to stop to to like pull the brakes on a program like that well yeah. and that's the thing we know that once i mean with agriculture you can fallow land you you know you they're all there's a lot of flexibility you could switch crops but once you allow massive you know development which is really what Buckeye and Queen Creek want to keep doing the same old sprawl development um, in their communities. There isn't a lot of flexibility. You're not gonna, you're not gonna, you know, shut it down. So that's that's why we think it's important to have as strong of provisions up front. And yeah, like you don't have enough water, so you you, you need to you need to limit your continued expansion. I, I do want to um, make sure that we talk about how water demand, it does not directly correlate with population growth or economic development. And, and this is, so, it's so important, especially for you folks who care enough to be listening to Sandy and me on a Sunday evening. This is about how we grow. It's about patterns of growth, rules around land use, much more than the fact of growth. Um, acre for acre, urban land use uses a lot less water than, than farming. So, you know, much, much less water. Uh, we have a, you can go to the Arizona Water Blueprint website and we have a, a, an explainer about this and a map and you can go and look at the water use per acre for different cities in the CAP service area where we have a lot of data. Um, but, and we can grow vertically. And when we grow vertically and more dense, we tend to use less water per acre because we have less yard and swimming pool and other uses like that. And more of the water that's used goes back into the system because it's flushed or it goes down the drain and then it can be recaptured and treated for reuse. So uh, it, it, I think it's important to understand that this is really about managing growth, you know, choices about growth more than um, the, the very fact of growth. And there, there are some choices that I think, you know, make more sense and some that make less sense in terms of water resilience for communities. That's a really, that's a really good point. Um, so in the eight minutes we have left, um, let's solve these problems. 
Um, so when Governor Ducey left office, he made a big fanfare about in, uh, allocating a billion dollars into a new water infrastructure finance authority. What has happened with that? And is that going to solve all our problems? Uh, well, the answer is no, uh, it's not going to solve all our problems. It w was the the billion dollars was for the augmentation fund, $333 million per year for three years. Mm -hmm. And it got the $333 million the first year, um, but not last year or this year. Um, his plan, you know, and we know there was all there were all kinds of shenanigans around this. Um, was to do this deal with um, desalination and the pipeline. And uh, there was an effort to rush something through in the waning days of his administration as well. Um, it is not the answer. Uh, the, um, the augmentation dollars, the way the law was written is mm -hmm. the projects have to be out of state. Important. So, it's Imported robbing water. <laughs> yeah. yeah, rob Peter to pay Paul. So, you know, and, and that's one of my beefs is we seldom think about what is happening on the other end of the pipeline, what kind of impacts it will have. <clears throat> I will say there were there was ARPA money, um, American Rescue Plan dollars that did go to some conservation projects. I know the Democrats had negotiated that into that bill. And um, so there have been some decent conservation projects funded, but those dollars are gone. The legislature yeah, it was not allocated dollars. anymore. We're, we're actually doing a, um, a study to evaluate the impacts of the $200 million in conservation grants, because a lot of it, a huge amount of it went to projects that arguably will not result in water conservation. So we'll, we'll, the jury is out, but a lot of it went to things like advanced metering, which doesn't necessarily save any water. But I would say um, I the, the what is happening now is that the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority is putting out a request for interest and is going to uh, select three or four um, of those um, uh, proposals and th by the, through the board and then walk them to, to the point of being NEPA ready, ready for uh, an environmental impact assessment. We'll see. In the meantime, we have other options for enlarging the water supply that are far uh, less disruptive and expensive. Um, probably the easiest one is that the Colorado River Indian tribes who are on the main stem received authorization to lease some of their Colorado River water. There are going to be cities that are looking to backfill their low priority CAP supplies. These would be high priority supplies. Um, SRP is, is piloting a project to lengthen the time it can store water that's up in the dam safety space. That means when there's a lot of water in the dam, they're lengthening the time that they can keep it in Roosevelt Dam so that they can take it off the dam and store it in aquifers and get long-term storage credits. Um, those, are, those are projects that could result in substantial supplies to help community water resilience, and they don't require any additional infrastructure. There's a discussion out there to to enlarge one of the dams on the Verde River and retire the upstream dam, that's Bartlett Dam. Um, that could result in a substantial new supply, but it will have environmental impacts, so time will tell. Um, there, there are three groundwater basins that were set aside. Um, we haven't mentioned this this evening, but there, the, the one rule about rural groundwater is that you can't pump out the water and transport it to the cities, uh, except Three Unless basins. you can. <laughs> Unless, except three basins. And yeah. one, one is next door to Buckeye, the Harquahala Basin. And there was legislation, I think it passed this year. Um, Unfortunately, in, in a, yes. Yeah, Buckeye <laughs> and Queen Creek have acquired land there in the Harquahala. And that would be, you know, a new supply of water not qualifying for that whiff of funding. And then there are the things like the Ocean Desal um, and some other projects like the Mississippi Pipeline, the Missouri Pipeline that are much more out there. They're not, the, the crit lease, Roosevelt Dam, 
maybe Bartlett, Harquahela groundwater, those things will, will result if they happen in very substantial amounts of water that with good management could be a giant solution. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Sandy, we have huge concerns about the um, Harquahela. I don't think we have time to get into it. But Kathy, I did want to mention, because we were going to get to rivers and we didn't, and this is a huge issue for Arizona. We've talked about the Colorado, but our other rivers are in trouble. We um, have seriously degraded uh, our major perennial rivers like the Colorado, the Gila, the Salt, the Santa Cruz, and the San Pedro. And it, it you know, groundwater pumping is projected to exceed um, the demand in several basins is expected to exceed base flow. And so endangering Agua Fria, Baba Kamari, up, um, Upper San Pedro, Upper Verde and Little Colorado rivers. And the Tonto National Forest is also predicted that five miles of Pinto Creek um, will die off in the next 20 years due to excessive groundwater pumping. We've lost approximately 90% of our riparian vegetation, which is really important. And so, and, and riparian vegetation and our rivers provide so much to us. I just feel like they always get short shrifted. I'm sorry, I'm rushing at the end to talk about them, but I just think it's important for people to understand that a huge part of our water problem is that we are killing our rivers. Mm -hmm. Well, and, um, and we, I just have to throw in there that we, the, the one solution that we have out there it, is completing our general stream adjudications. It's, it's ongoing and our, our state under resources, the court and under resources, uh, the department of water resources it has for a long time. And, that's part of the reason why the adjudication has dragged out. That's the only place where there will be a recognition of a legal connection between pumping, what, what would be called groundwater, but it isn't really because it's the subsurface flow of a river. So that, mm -hmm. that's really the theory of victory, complete the adjudications. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I want to end in the way that CEBV always does, which is what can we do to take action ourselves to, to positively impact this situation? Um, Sandy, why don't you start? Uh, well, I think the first thing is a lot of people don't get involved in water issues because it can be very complicated and they hear people speaking in code. Don't let that stop you. Um, it, you know, when you get down to it, it is, you know, very basic, like using more than you have is not sustainable. And so, and deciding what our priorities are, uh, ask your legislators what they're doing on water, what bills they're supporting, uh, what they plan to do next session, pay attention to what's going on with the Central Arizona Water Conservation District Board. Um, yeah, pay attention to what's going on with the governor's uh, water councils. They have these uh, councils. You can, you can watch them uh, uh, remotely and weigh in when there's an opportunity to comment. I mean, I'm not on those councils and I don't hesitate to weigh in. And, and provide comments, write letters to the editor, tell your neighbors, talk to your neighbors, try to get stronger uh, rules in place. And, you know, and some, some communities have actually um, done initiatives like in the Douglas community and in Wilcox as well. They're like, oh, you're not gonna do anything for us. We're going to take this into our own hands. And I think if more communities did that, uh, we would see the legislature start responding a bit more. I, I agree, Sandy. I think especially um, rural, the, the rural counterpoint to what we've seen about rural groundwater, um, I don't think enough rural voices have been heard. Um, but I would uh, invite you to uh, go to the Arizona Water Blueprint and partway down is a sign up for our newsletter uh, link, we send out um, erratic 
uh, not much stuff, but we do try, you know, as a neutral nonpartisan think tank, we try to develop reports and content that will help you become empowered to, to be uh, involved. And I really agree with Sandy. And I'll add one more thing. Um, we're part of the ASU's Arizona Water Innovation Initiative, which was when Governor Ducey gave money to each of the universities and he t gave some to ASU and said, do, do, do something about water. And we're currently offering uh, facilitation in partnership with the Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy and others, facilitation for rural groundwater workshops. If you're interested, we're right now the focus is outside of active management areas, but if you're from a community that's interested, um, I, you know, I, please get in touch with me and I'll, I'll um, point you to the, to what, you know, the process, but we've seen huge results down in Wilcox with these rural, where different community members are pulled together. They get, they, they figure out what their information is, what their gaps are, and what are the steps that they can take to make a difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think really the answer is usually when our lawmakers are not doing the job, we need to push them um, to do so. So uh, we are, our organization helps people do that. We know that all of, most of you on this call have done a lot of pushing and pushing over the years. So um, I am sure this is not the last conversation we're going to have on water. And I feel like we barely scraped the surface. Um, so I want to thank you both, Sandy and Sarah. This, this has been so informative, so helpful. And I know there is just a ton of interest. So hopefully we will be able to all make a difference going forward. We absolutely need to. So thank you again so much. Thank Kathy, you. Just to check in, are, are the links that I've been providing in the, the deck, will that all be in a follow-up email? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone. Thank you all so much for showing up on a Sunday afternoon and hearing about water. So don't despair. A lot of that is, uh, we can have an impact. So, right on. Thank you all. Okay. Bye-bye.